so hello everyone, my name's Alex. Uh, I know quite a few of you, I think. Um, so I'm going to talk today about the RCA. A um, few tips how not to freak out, how to hopefully pass, and just a few things I learned along the way um, about things to make it a bit easier. So I'm really sorry if this is teaching some of you to suck eggs. I know some people will have looked into this already, some people have passed it. Um, so I've just tried to include stuff that's relevant to as many people as possible uh, so there might be some crossover you may know a lot of this already feel free to tune out entirely um, and I do go into quite a bit of detail about practicalities um, along the way so I'll talk a bit about what the RCA is um, a lot of screenshots about how to actually record on 14 fish a little bit about sort of applying how it's marked and uh, consent and examinations and then just a few things that I've learned along the way that I wish I'd known at the beginning. So the RCA stands for the Recorded Consultation Assessment. Um, and during delightful COVID time, it's replaced the CSA or the Clinical Skills Assessment, but the aim is essentially the same. So uh, by the end of it, if you pass, you're judged to be clinically safe to practice independently. And so the aim of it is to show that you are clinically safe. So you have to submit 13 cases rather than going up to London and then giving you 13 trained actors who will challenge you appropriately, you have to choose your cases to submit. And you can either do video, you can do phone, or you can do a mixture. So the good stuff, um, you can mess up all but 13 consultations and then just delete them at the end, um, which is quite helpful. It's a lot less pressure from that point of view. You can, if, if you have information about what they're coming in for, you can check the guidelines in advance, you can come up with a rough plan. Um, and it is slightly cheaper. I think it's still about a grand, but the CSA thinks about was about fourteen hundred. So you save a bit of money. Um, though one of my colleagues worked out it's something like eight pounds a minute. So it's not that cheap. Um, the thing I really liked was you can't revise when you're not at work. So you don't have that guilt like you do with the AKT and like people did have with the CSA. Uh, you work when you're at work. You do need to listen to a few recordings towards the end, but other than that, it's it's your own time, which is nice. Um, it's not perfect. It's still quite new. My trainer hadn't ever put anyone through the RCA. Um, and so I was leading her quite a lot and other people in the practice. And although you don't have the stress of revising, selecting the right cases um, and the right level of complexity, which I'll talk about later, can be quite stressful. And patients are patients. They're not perfect. They're not trained. They ramble. They try and sneak in five problems when you've got 10 minutes or 12 minutes. Um, and the cost, which we'll be talking about. So... You have to submit your 13 cases and back when they first launched that you could submit any 13 and they realized that people were just sort of submitting sort of 13 molds um, or 13 coughs and so they have now introduced mandatory criteria so they're quite easy to cover really you need to do a child who's under 16 an older adult uh, over 65 I think is what they count as that anything from maternal and reproductive health mental health, an acute case, which I'll talk about later, and a long-term condition. And then there's these recommended criteria. So these, you won't fail if you don't do them, but they've noticed that people who do better tend to do these things. So um, no more than two cases from the same clinical topic area, so not five respiratory cases. Um, examinations used to be mandatory. They're now recommended because they found that people were talking through examinations like you would in an OSCE and not really, it wasn't really relevant to the patient. Um, and a broad spread of clinical cases, which is really fluffy, but you know, that's what they recommend. So a little bit more about the criteria. Um, so the child less than 16, you need to explore the impact of the child's age. So they're quite specific about that. So that could be um, if they're I don't know, a toddler, are they up to date with the vaccinations? Do they go to nursery? Are they developing as they should be? Uh, an older child, how are they getting on at school? Something quite, it doesn't have to be in depth, but you just need to show that you're aware that being a child has an impact. Um, the older adult, they just need to be over 65. So you don't need to talk about their age specifically. And then the acute case can be anything which um, you would immediately send to hospital. 
or immediate or, or urgent investigation. So that could include, I think we need to do bloods today because X, Y, Z. Um, but it wouldn't include a simple, oh, we probably should see you. So it's slightly more acute than that. Um, mental health is any, basically anything mental health related to anything with DSM or ICD uh, classification. So up until recently, you could include a breast lump as part of your maternal and reproductive health. Now they've said you can't uh, purely because people weren't doing very well on it because it's quite simple. Um, other than that, I mean, it's, it basically as what it says on the tin, except with sexual health, they're very clear that it's not just a passing inquiry of, so if someone's got erectile dysfunction or prostate symptoms, um, it needs to be an actual proper sexual history. Um, and then the long-term condition can basically be anything apart from a new diagnosis of a, or a new potential diagnosis of a long-term condition. So what they're looking at is whether you're aware of how the condition they have affects their current management. So I had a chap with a cough who was um, on chemo. So it was whether or not he, we needed to assess him for neutropenia. We had a lower threshold for antibiotics, that sort of thing. Um, but no sort of new type 2 diabetes or anything like that. So in terms of how it's marked, um, you now have 12 minutes, which is much better. And that 12 minutes doesn't include checking the patient details or consent. Um, so effectively, they start the clock when you say you're opening gambit. So as soon as you say, how can I help, they start the clock. And it's marked in three domains. So you've got your data gathering, decision making and interpersonal skills. And I'll talk about those a bit more in a minute. The website says it's marked by at least one examiner, which feels a bit weird because I'm pretty sure it used to be two, and I'm fairly sure it is two examiners because it's a total of nine points per case. For each case, you get 18 marks for. So I think the ideally, they have two examiners independently marking each case. And then they mark it as a global assessment. So it's not that you have to get every tick box. It's not that they have a checklist and if you don't get one of them you get no points it's more a global impression with um you can be clear fail fail pass and clear pass each one's marked out of three so zero is clear fail and then one two three for fail pass and clear pass so for data gathering i've basically gone through there's quite a wordy rcgp statement with all the um all the all the domains so i've gone through them and tried to break them down to make them a little bit more understandable um so and don't quote me on this but this is kind of what i used and found quite helpful so from the data gathering point of view um you've got your history your ice and your examination so are you focused and safe do you rule out appropriate red flags and consider appropriate diagnoses when it comes to patient issues and priorities basically as long as you get ice in i think that ticks that box and then um examination it just says plans and carries out appropriate examination so you can either carry them out if they're face to face or plan them and describe them um, if they're on the phone decision making clinical management is quite meaty so that's basically all the rest so do you come up with a good potential diagnosis is your management safe and complete I don't really know what they mean by where possible evidence-based decisions. I guess it's make sure it's up to date and correct, which I hope we would do anyway. And then from my point of view, when I looked at it, it seemed to be quite a lot about risk management. So can you manage risk and safety net appropriately? And by that, I took to mean, don't ask 55 red flags that aren't relevant because we've only got 12 minutes. And with the realistic safety net, don't tell someone with a fungal toenail to call 999 if it gets a bit more sore. So make sure that it's patient focused. And they have included that on their blurb that some people were doing that. So, um, so it's just something to be mindful of. And then the interpersonal skills. Um, again, ICE comes into it a lot. I'd hope that most of us can do the history bit quite naturally, letting a patient talk, but you know, it's there. Um, and then being involved in, oh, being involved in management, reaching a shared understanding, and basically being nice and understandable. So relatively straightforward, I think, from the interpersonal skills point of view. So I don't know why they call them diets, but this is just a list of the um, of the sittings over the next year, just for your reference. 
Um, you can find this on the RCGP website. It does take a bit of digging. So if you Google application dates RCA, sometimes that makes it a bit easier. So you have your application window. Um, the key things, I don't know why they include the assessment period, but the key things are even if you apply, say, for the November one, even if you're applying in October, you can submit cases that you've been recording for quite a few months before that. So it's actually the submission date that you really care about. The results date can change. It did with mine. If they have a lot of people who apply and they don't have many people marking, then they sometimes run out of time and they extend it, uh, which is a bit of a pain. So I'm going to take you through the sort of practicalities of how to record on 14 fish. This is the bit that might be teaching you to suck eggs and feel free to go make a cup of tea. You're not going to miss anything. But if you haven't done it before, I thought I'd just walk you through the ins and outs of how to do it because it's a bit of a weird system, but it works quite well. So everything's done on 14 fish. Um, everyone should have 200 minutes on their account already completely free. They do charge um, if you go over. So I purchased an extra 200 minutes before I applied. It's not cheap, but it's not terrible. So it's, I think I paid £19.80 for 200 minutes. I imagine it's similar now. And then when you actually apply for your exam, you get 600 minutes added. Um, and as I said, you can submit anything which has been recorded in the six months leading up to the results being published. Um, and that 14 fish will automatically delete stuff as that six months come up. So if it's there, you can submit it. So lots of screenshots now. So on your welcome page, uh, on the top right, there's a 14 fish consult. If you click on that, you'll come up with this page. So it gives you the option to do a video call, a phone call, or an upload. Um, I did entirely phone calls, so I'll show you the phone call one specifically, but the video one I've had a look and it's really, really similar. The option to upload your own file, I don't know anyone that's done that, um, but they do have guidelines on the 14 Fish website and on the RCGP website. I think it's quite simple to actually upload the file, but then you have to prove your consent, which I'll talk about later. So you start a new consultation, you click on phone call, that takes you to, through to this. So at this point, or at some point, you will need your own mobile phone. 14 Fish knows your mobile number, which might freak you out. Um, and it will send you a text message with a code. 14 Fish will ask for the code just to show that you are who you say you are. After that point, it doesn't do it anymore. You put in the patient's phone number and click phone patient, and it will automatically call the patient and do a consent recording. Um, they listen to that consent, I think they have the option of one or two, or they may not reply. So things I noticed, if it goes, so the bit that says listening to consent message on the patient side, it will say ringing first. If it goes ringing once and then goes straight to listening to consent, it's probably gone straight to their voicemail. If they're listening to the consent message for ages, again, it's probably gone to voicemail. Um, once you've done this, if they consent, then it will give you a phone number to call, which you can call off any phone, and then a code. Once you've entered that code, it will connect you. And then from that point on, it's recording. Um, it will show, yeah, so it will show connected and connected um, when you are actually connected, so you'll know, but you'll be able to hear that you're connected. It's really obvious. Then when you hang up, do your call, and then you get this page. So the technical point of view stuff is just them um, trying to improve the quality. Sometimes the quality is not great. I didn't have many problems, um, but you can put in some feedback. And then below that is a workbook. So you can name your title, you can name it what you like, you can edit that, you can change it before you submit it. So I put things like too simple, possible, definite, and then the, a, a little bit about it. And then below that, you can also allocate it to a clinical uh, topic. And if you feel that it fulfills one of your mandatory criteria, you can also do that with a justification. Okay. So that's got your criteria and I'll drop down and you can justify it. So you can, you can apply two cases to each criteria. So you can have two children, two mental health, 
the reason being, if you if you think you've fulfilled the criteria for an acute case, but the examiner doesn't, you've got a backup. So you don't have to pass both of them. Or if you submit an acute and, it, and you fail it, then you have a backup case. So you can just submit two for each of them. So a little bit about consent. Um, this got people in quite a flap when we were doing it. Um, essentially, 14 Fish does the consent. Um, if it's a mobile number, they'll also send my follow-up text afterwards saying, are you sure you really want them to record this? Um, so they, they really do deal with the consent. Uh, home phones, they don't do the bit at the end. So it is best practice just before you hang up, say, you know, you know you can withdraw this at any time, you're still happy. Um, you can do that after your 12 minutes. The examiners don't care whether it's there. It's just if later on a patient says, oh, I didn't consent, then we can go back and check. So the consent isn't part of the marking process. The examiners don't care. I mean, I'm sure they care, but they don't care from a marking point of view. Um, and so it's not included in your timing. So if you wanted to, you could consent every patient verbally as well. I didn't. I did it on a couple. I found it awkward and stilted. I couldn't get the words right. Um, and I was quite happy that 14 Fish were doing it. So occasionally patients, when you first get onto the phone with them, will say, oh, that's something I've not had before. And so I would just sort of explain what it's for and check they were happy. Some people would call patients in advance, not off the, pro off the program, and explain. Again, I found going back to a call and pretending it was new was too stilted and most people didn't have a problem in the first place so I didn't but so a lot of people do so the consent if you're uploading a file separately is uh slightly different so you you basically have to upload a document to prove that they've consented now that can be apparently a screenshot of a text message which I'm assuming is accurix or something similar rather than just you texting a patient um or the RCGP website has loads of consent forms, so you can print them off, get them signed and scanned in. Um, frankly, I thought it was a bit of faff, so I didn't, but the option's there. So a little bit about how to actually apply. Um, so you go to the RCGP website within the examination window. I don't know whether they run out of places, um, but the way I viewed it was I decided to do it the sooner I applied, the sooner I got my three minutes. So I applied quite early. Um, so once you apply, your screen changes a little bit. You get your 600 minutes. And then next to each recording, you have shared and verified, which I think are there anyway. And then you get these stars. So it's really simple. If you want to submit a case or if you're not sure, you can star it. Um, and then you basically have to have 13 stars when you submit it and they, they are the cases you will submit. You can also see the spread of clinical topics of your recordings. Um, and you can easily see, it says sort of like six out of seven, seven out of seven mandatory criteria have been fulfilled. And then there's also the option to submit with a little rocket next to it. So that's what you get at the top. Um, which is pretty self-explanatory. And then if you click on clinical topic spread, you get the option to see all your consultations in a little pie chart um, according to clinical topics, or it's a bit blurry. Um, or you can select starred consultations and it will show you if, if you've got more than two, it will show you whether you've got a good spread visually. Um, so that is quite helpful in the run-up. So I think we were gonna have a quick break now. What we could do is, I've got, I'm probably about halfway through, we could power on and then have a break afterwards before a bit of an activity, because I haven't actually been talking for very long. Are people happy with that? Okay. Um, so examinations, it used to be mandatory. You used to have to include two examinations. Um, and what they said was that they found that people, I think I've said this already, people were just talking to the examiner and the patient was entirely confused. So. If you're on the phone, you can explain the examination you want to do, but it needs to be relevant to the patient and relevant to what you're actually doing. Um, I found ex explaining things like speculum exams, prostate exams quite helpful um, because you're always going to need to explain that to a patient in quite a lot of detail. Um, whereas abdo exams and respiratory exams felt a bit stilted because they don't 
I don't think patients mind as much if you're listening to their chest. So um, face to face, you can examine them on camera as long as you don't expose anything in their swimsuit area. Um, if it, you can still examine them, if that's going to be the case, but you need to do it behind a camera and talk through what you're doing. So um, I've included a picture, but if, effectively, if they're under two, anything covered by a nappy shouldn't be exposed. And if they're over two, if it's boys, anything covered by trunks, and if it's girls, anything covered by a bikini should stay under wraps if it's gonna be on camera. If at any point it is shown on camera, that case is disregarded. So it is quite important. Um, and this was sort of another reason I didn't do videos, but I know a lot of people did. So I think the main source of stress for me and for a lot of other people I've spoken to in the RCA is complexity. So they initially found that people were not getting their very many points for simple cases. And it's not that there's anything wrong with them, it's more that you just don't have the opportunity to show that you have the skills that they need to see. So they've issued some guidance. There's quite a long document on the website, um, which I've tried to distill into one slide, but if you're not sure, it might be worth going back into that. Essentially, anything which could obviously be dealt with by a nurse practitioner or an HCA, you're not going to get the points for. So a simple UTI, simple viral warts, um, a cough or a cold that just needs a bit of advice, there's no point. Um, unless you've got a simple problem which has some complicating factors. And they have gone through and given four domains in which you can add challenge and complexity. So from a presentation point of view, if it's something rare, um, then that's automatically a higher challenge case. So they give the example of myasthenia gravis, even if they present really typically, because it's a rare, a rare presentation, you, that would be considered higher challenge. But it can be something common, um, which you bread and butter, but that is presenting atypically. So you're having to think a little bit outside the box and that adds challenge. In terms of management, um, if you're having to negotiate a lot, that adds to challenge. Or if they are on 15 different medications and they've got gout and you need to work out what they can and can't take. Um, or if they want to take a, a really strange um, regime for HRT or the pill or something, then that would add complexity. And then with the patient, anything unusual or unrealistic. So if you're having to negotiate um, the urgency with which you think they need to be seen or um, if they've got a weird health belief that you're having to sort of unpick a little bit, that would add complexity. And anything about their situation. So have they got um, a family member at home who they care for, which means they can't attend a two-week wait very easily um, or are they moving abroad imminently? All of these things take up uh, take up time, need some negotiation, and they would add complexity. So if you've got someone with a UTI, it can be made suitable by any of these things. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to include a little bit about what my sort of RCA process looked like. So um, I sat the May sitting. I started recording sort of occasionally from February. Um, and by occasionally, I mean sort of if I was down to help duty and I saw something that looked quite good, I would just record it and see mainly where I was at, really. Um, and I did that sort of February onwards and then started recording relatively regularly from about late March, but not really taking it, not, not going too hard, but upping the ante a little. And then I had sort of an arrangement with work where in the two weeks in the run-up to submission, I didn't have any patients booked. And I was I, I was down to help duty, but equally I cherry-picked from everyone else's list, which was great. So um, that was the best thing about it, was the two weeks before. And by the end, I think I had maybe 50% of what I wanted at the beginning, and by the end I, I relatively comfortably had 13 that I was quite happy with. So I did all phone. Um, I didn't do any videos. I know some people did a mix and some people who did mainly video. Um, main issue with me was um, I couldn't get the camera to sit in the right place and it just felt too clunky. So I 
I did the phone and it was fine. I, I used my initial 200 minutes before I applied. So I bought some more minutes and then I had, I think, 80, 80 something left at the end. In hindsight, I'm not sure I needed the extra 200, but it took some of the stress off. Um, so I scored a fail on uh, clinical management on one of my cases. Um, I had a low complexity case. I had two or three where uh, they said the management was insufficient because I ran out of time. I had a few other um, great descriptors that were not flattering at all and I still passed. So the point I'm making is that it doesn't have to be perfect at all. You can, you can fail bits, you can mess up and that's okay. It really doesn't have to be perfect. And I think if I'd known that at the outset, I would have been a little bit more chilled about the whole process. Um, obviously, you want them to be as good as you can, but I thought, sort of thought they had to be 13 perfect cases. And it turns out that wasn't the case. They weren't, and that was okay. So in terms of the results, they're published at 5 p.m. on your portfolio, 5 p.m. on the dot. Um, and with that, you get some feedback. So you get these generic grade descriptors and it will be something like they're published in advance. You can access them in advance. It can be things like wasn't complex enough. Um, as far it goes as far as didn't respect patient dignity. Um, clinical management was just wrong. I got one of those. Um, but they're not linked to cases. So it's basically as much use as a chocolate teapot as far as I'm concerned. The 14 fish people say that they've considered including it, but that they didn't think it would be helpful. Not sure about that. But anyway, um, they said you wouldn't be able to remember the cases you submitted. But from my point of view, I felt like it was completely useless knowing that I've done 15 things wrong without knowing how to improve. But anyway, you get those. You also get a histogram of your cases scores. So you get two, I got two scores per case I submitted and for each domain that will sit on a histogram and it will show you whether you've got fail, clear fail, pass, clear pass and what proportion. You get a raw mark with some information about your part about what the pass mark was for each sitting and then at some point afterwards like the AKT there is an examiner's report um, which I think is probably less helpful than the AKT one which tells you what the highest mark was, what the pass rate was and what the average score was, if you're interested. So I've put together a few tips for recording. Make sure you practice know what you're doing. Um, partly because you will be slower. It takes, it's not just the straight sort of 12 minutes. Uh, you will want to look up the guidelines beforehand. You will want to have a good look through their notes. Um, and equally afterwards there is still a little bit of like admin so when you save it you want to be able to say what clinical topic it is link it to a criterion justify that it just takes a bit more time and the other thing is towards the end people will say oh I've got this patient with new AF do you want to call them so they were really really helpful um so make sure the practice are on board the other thing is make a sign for your door to let people know that you're recording so they don't barge in more important if you're doing videos than phone but I did have one where someone walked in halfway through and uh, start recording early start recording now even if you're miles off thinking about sitting it just so that you've got a baseline because I was doing really weird stuff that I had no idea about and it just means that you start a little bit more ahead when you actually come to think about the exam uh, the other thing is it's really awkward listening to your doctor voice it's bad enough listening to your voice, but listening to your doctor voice is a new level of awkward. So if you can get that out of the way and get used to it, because you need to listen to them all, you need to mark them. So I would just start as early as you can. And 200 minutes is quite a lot. Um, and then once you get closer to the exam, mark yourself. And by that, I mean, be really objective. Don't be too harsh, but be really objective if you can. There are loads and loads of mark schemes on the internet. We're going to include some links to some useful ones. Um, and it doesn't have to be perfect to submit it. Um, cherry pick. Cherry pick, cherry pick, cherry pick. Be selfish is what one of the trainers said to me at the practice. Maybe not for the whole sort of five months in the run-up, but in the immediate run-up, 
you, you need to get these cases and the best way to do that is to be given the time and the room to pick which cases are going to be useful because a lot of stuff just isn't going to be appropriate and that's okay as long as you can pick the ones that are so I helped with duty but I also cherry picked off people's lists and just sent them a note beforehand saying is that okay but most of the time they were quite happy to have a patient taken off their afternoon list so it was fine so when it comes to submitting you have to submit every case to your supervisor so that they can prove that it's you and prove that the patient is real so they have to listen and say yep this is Alex and that patient is not an actor um if you want them to listen and it is a good idea if you want them to listen through the case and make sure they're happy for you to submit it it takes quite a lot of time so start that process a little bit earlier than you perhaps might think to the other thing which is quite helpful which I haven't included it here is when you're listening back when you come to listen back to sort of like a big bulk of recordings there's the option to speed it up so you can listen to yourself at 1.5 speed and two you sound like a chipmunk wouldn't recommend it but 1.5 it just makes it a bit easier to get through it all and you still sound like a human so have a play around with that and you can save quite a lot of time uh, the other thing which I did do, which I think was useful, was quite early on in the process, I shared a couple with my supervisor, this was even before I'd applied, um, just to get some sort of baseline feedback about where they thought I was at um, and and to see when it actually comes to submit whether they're better or worse, really. So that's quite helpful. But again, it takes time. I only submitted a couple. Um, so there are a few things that about halfway through recording I realised were quite helpful and I wish I'd started doing them earlier. So one of the things that you get, a mark, or you get marked on is whether or not you make a diagnosis. Um, and I found with the early ones, I was making a diagnosis in my head. But when I listened back, at no point did I verbalise that. And at no point was it clear that actually I'd reached a diagnosis. So I started saying things like, there are a few things running through my head. And then that forces you to explain to the patient what you think is going on. Even if you don't know, you can say, I do think it might be this, it might not be that. And in the same way with management, in order to get a shared management plan, you kind of need to give them options. So if you, if you open it with we have a couple of options you then have to give them a couple of options and it is quite I had to make it quite a conscious thing because otherwise I was just being fluffy and saying oh we could do this we could do this um and also doing nothing is sometimes an option and if you've got your eyes in that might be all they want they might just want to know that they've got an arthritic knee they might not want painkillers um and then in terms of timings for the first month or so I was just running over consistently so if you try and set a, I had a clock on my phone as in on the phone that I was calling from if you try and set a six or seven minute point at which you give yourself a few seconds to wrap up and then force yourself to move on to the there are a few things running through my head then you won't run out of time because it's quite easy from what I've read and from what I did to take a great history and then just run out of time and then the case isn't really submittable which is a shame so um, I think it's better to take what is a less what you think is a less thorough history but get everything in because you will get more points that way um, and a few things just generally I wish I'd known so duty is great as I mentioned but sometimes cherry picking off people's lists was actually better because what people perceive to be an on their day issue isn't necessarily always appropriate for a full 12 minute consult. Sometimes people who have made an appointment two weeks ago for a new problem, their cases are, are the better ones. So just keep an eye out. Um, as I've said, trainers are new to this too. So just, you might need to say, I need you to listen to this. This is what you need to do. This is the feed specific feedback I want. Um, bear in mind it's a global assessment. So essentially they're checking, are you nice? Are you sensible? And are you safe to be a GP? Um, and just keep that in mind because I found it really, really easy to get bogged down in the minutiae of have I asked this? Have I done this? And actually, if you take a step back, is that showing you at your best? On the flip side, if it feels too easy to fit into 12 minutes, then it probably is. 
um, and I'd go back to that complexity thing. Uh, you don't have to finish on time. You don't have to have wrapped everything up entirely in 12 minutes. You just need to have shown enough in that 12 minutes. So I think I was going to go through, but I can't find actually what I submitted because they delete it when your results come out. But I think probably only about 50% I finished in the time and the other 50% went on maybe another minute or two. But there was enough in there, I felt, to submit. Um, and yeah, it doesn't have to be perfect. So these are things that I found very helpful and other people have found very helpful. The 14 fish RCA package I didn't do. I know some people that did. Um, some people find it really helpful. It gave them peace of mind. I think it's about 170 quid. Um, I didn't get it because I found that if you look around, there's enough free stuff that can help you out. So the 14 fish channel on YouTube has quite a few free videos. Um, it doesn't have the fancy stuff like the um, role plays and all that sort of stuff, but it does have um, that slightly annoying guy sitting there talking through uh, real questions. And I think they have live webinars as well. The Bradford VTS website is the best thing since sliced bread. There's so much stuff on there. It's incredible, um, including there's a sign that you can print off your door. There's about 50 mark schemes. There's useful links to some of the rcgp resources as well um and also have a good bitch because it's quite it, picking picking the cases is a bit stressful and saying oh i've got this i've got this case i'm not really sure whether it's complex enough what do you think and also people that have done the exam can be helpful from that point of view so you can use each other the deanery rca preparation day you may well get an email when our email came out, it said it cost £325 a day, um, which I wasn't going to do. And then my friend emailed and said, why is it so much? And she said, oh, if you're from Exeter, it's free. So if you get, a, I think it was a Tamar um, deanery-wide RCA preparation day with a price, email them because it may well be free. And it was good. It was worth going to. It was a little bit death by Zoom, but it was worth going to. Um, and also your trainer. So you have to submit all of the cases for to be verified. I, I know some people submitted everything to them for full feedback and listening to and a couple of extras. I didn't, um, but I submitted everything that I wasn't sure about, anything that I, and, and a few that it was like, it's between these two cases. Can you tell me which one you think is better? And then there were a few that I was relatively happy with. So she just skipped through them and verified that it was me. So it's up to you. Some trainers will listen to a lot more. Some will listen to a lot less. But either way, they're a really good source of support. Any questions? Yeah, I just had a quick question, Alex. Yeah. Um, so, so you said, so, so if you're doing a telephone call, um, mm -hmm. We allowed to sort of keep the formulary open in front of us. It was yeah. a bit cheeky. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so. I did one where it actually was a bit detrimental because I had the formulary open. It was for childhood constipation, yeah. and I was just reading off the wrong age. So do be careful if you do it. But yeah, yeah, you can. The joy of two screens. Okay. Fine. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Alex, can yeah. I ask about? I think I put it in the chat, but I just wanted to clarify. I, you know, so I'm been recording for a while. And say I've got a case that's still within six months of my submission date, but will it get archived if it then goes into seven months by the time they were looking at it or results? So it's, it's six months from the date your results will be published. Okay, so they don't count, so they'll get archived so, in the meantime. So yeah, if they're archived in the meantime, then you can't. They have to be they have to be valid within the six months until the published results date, not submission date. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Catherine, if it helps, um, you can use Google to count backwards 182 days from the results date. Cause I've it it says that. on, um, if you like go on the workbook, it actually tells you when it's going to be archived. There's a date on it each one. Even better than. <laughs> but you found a very nifty techno mm -hmm. way. I would never have found that. <laughs> it's really disappointing because I've got three good ones that are going to get archived. Anyway. Um, Alex, you know when you're um, describing your justification and stuff like that, is there criteria that you can use or is it just 
what you think. I didn't catch that, I'm really sorry. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, the justification when you've done your case, yeah. is there like a criteria that you follow or is that just what you, uh, what you think the case showcases? So there is guidance on the website, which is basically the table that I've got in this presentation. And you just, I, I don't think it necessarily counts for marking as such, but if, if they don't think it's obvious, they'll look at your justification. So if you've got, I don't know, a long-term condition, I would just say why you think it is relevant, why it's complicated, the, compl uh, the com consultation. But there's no set criteria other than, so for my mental health one, I literally said, this is a patient with depression and that's fine. Um, I was just going to say a couple of things. So I just shared um, a seven deanery um, document, uh, which has got something called a RAG rating on it. Um, I would encourage you to print that out and have it in front of you whilst you're doing um, your um, telephone calls or whatever, while you're doing your recordings. Um, it's also a good thing to use with your trainer. Um, if you're looking at your... Um, if you're going through recordings and, uh, and actually I'd really encourage you to use some of your, your tutorial time uh, to go through some of your recordings um, and basically kind of uh, both mark, uh, mark each of your, your recordings that you've done. Um, it's, it's a really kind of useful guide. Um, I've had, I've only had one trainee go through the RCA um, and there isn't really a limit to what you have in front of you while you're doing the consultations. You, you could have the RAG rating thing that I just sent. You could have a copy of Damien Kenny's consultation skills model in front of you that you can work through as you're talking to the person. You know, the examiners don't, don't see what's in front of you if you're recording telephone con, uh, consultations. So, uh, you know, there are all sorts of little kind of tips and tricks and, uh, you know, if you if you know um, if you know roughly what the consultation is going to be about, there's no reason why you can't have things on your screen that will make you seem slicker. Um, because we all do it. You know, I do it if I'm on the on the phone to somebody uh, and they start talking about some drugs that I don't know about. I I will just Google it and then it seems like I know what I'm talking about. Um, there's no harm in that at all. From a, from a trainer's point of view, so um, your trainer may or probably more likely may not have been through this before. Uh, you know, this is, a, this is a relatively new thing. Um, and of course, trainers um, don't always have an ST3. So sometimes they're with an ST1, sometimes with, a, with an ST2. So certainly not all of the, the trainers in the... Um, uh, in the kind of locality will have been through the RCA. So you may well know more about the RCA than, than they do. Um, we have kind of regular meetings with all of the trainers called the Joint Trainers Workshop. Uh, and we have had a session on the RCA. Um, so they should know roughly what you're expected to do. Um, we will keep going. And I think I'm going to do a little bit of an update for them at the next Trainers Workshop about the RCA um, Alex has uh, kindly agreed slash been pressured into um, doing a bit of a talk of, about how it feels as a trainee. Um, I think just kind of it's important for you guys to, to know that in the past when we had the CSA as a, as a, as a trainee, your, your trainee generally meets up with some friends, does some practice and then gets quite stressed, uh, goes to London and comes back very stressed still thinking they failed their exam and uh you know a few weeks later you find that they passed but in terms of the impact um to the surgery it's pretty minimal because you just carry on doing your day job um i think it's really important that the trainers know that this is a bit different than that and you do need time set aside um it's not a case of just recording every patient you have in the surgery because you've got to meet those 
uh, the kind of guidelines that Alex has, has talked, talked through and you've got to get a good case mix. Um, so hopefully all your training practices will slowly be kind of cottoning on to what the RCA is um, and the fact that for two, three, however long um, it takes really, uh, you won't be just kind of plowing through, you know, 10 or 12 patients a session or whatever you, whatever you normally do. Um, it's really important that they, you know, treat you as a trainee and set, set time aside for you to do this. Um, if, they're, if they're unsympathetic towards it, then um, please just, just ask them to speak to one of us. Um, and, and as I said, we're doing our, our best from this side to make sure they're all aware of what the requirements for you guys guys is um, and that you will need time time to do these recordings. So yeah, if, if you do have any problems in terms of finding time to do it, please let me know. Um, and I'm happy to talk to any trainers that are being tricky. The other thing uh, included on that, I think I've shared the file, might work, might not, hope it does. Um, there's a link to a consultation model of Bradford VTS, and I literally printed it out and had it in front of me. Um, and it gives you details of timings, when to move on, what to include. Uh, so that was really helpful. I was going to ask, what if a patient wants to, you know, when they sneak in a few problems um, and they put their shopping list, did that ever happen to you while you were trying to record and would you lose points if you kind of then got distracted and did that or um, or you had to say no, we can only talk about one thing? So what they said at the RCA day, the deanery day, was you can either try and do deal with two problems in one in in the 12 minutes which is difficult or you can say you can negotiate it and as long as you have your first consultation is 12 minutes worth of decent complex consultation they then stop listening so you could then have a double consultation if you wanted and they wouldn't know they literally stop the clock stop listening so it, it doesn't really matter if you then go on to talk about something else or you then spend 10 minutes trying to work out when they could come in for an appointment. They just don't listen. Does that make sense? Well, obviously good to feel like you've wrapped up the consultation. That's the difficult thing, I think, is that they literally do turn it off and stop listening. So after that point, even if you, you know, diagnose some weird and wonderful, amazing condition, they, they, they won't mark it. So um, it is okay to kind of wrap up one consultation and then move on to the next thing, but just make sure you get in your safety netting and all that kind of thing. Um, I think what, so when I did this with Lottie, um, so Alex, the, the process by the patient gets told about it. There's some funny recording system, isn't there? And we actually found it a lot better when when we phoned the patient first and explained what was going to happen so we just phoned them and said look um you're going to have a consultation today if it's okay with you um we, we might use it for um for an assessment uh, in a minute you're going to get a funny message it's not a scam um just go with it basically and actually doing the kind of pre phone call thing was really helpful um, we had a lot of people who said no to it, um, but actually when we called them in advance and said, look, this is what's going to happen, um, a funny robot voice is going to phone you up, but actually you will get connected to a doctor and the consultation will be the same as normal. Um, that really helped to get people on board with it. Um, so that's something to consider. Any other questions? Um, just a quick one about the examination. So obviously if they're there face to face, it's going to take a lot longer than if you're on a telephone consultation and you just say, I don't know, how would you explain it on a telephone consultation if you wanted to do just a simple respiratory exam? You know, what type of things do they want to hear? So I don't know exactly what they want to hear, but I can tell you what I said. Yeah. Um, so I basically said, I'll bring you in. Um, and have a listen to your chest. I'm listening for extra noises which might suggest an infection. 
I'll also want to check your oxygen levels just to check that they're as they should be. Um, and I would sort of give an indication of what I was expecting to hear. So if they sounded really breathless, then I'd be more worried about their SATs. But if they if I didn't expect them to have abnormal SATs, then you know, I'm expecting them to be normal, but it's helpful to check. Um, and just sort of say what I'll do and explain it in patient terms. Um, and I, I don't know whether I passed them. I think I did, but they don't tell you. So seem to go okay. It just, I'm just wondering what the benefit is actually from the video consultation, because actually it sounds like it's going to be a lot quicker and easier. So. Yeah, that's why I did the phone. But some people prefer video, but I, yeah, I, I prefer the phone massively. But as I said, things like speculum exams and prostate exams, I think that's it's more, it feels more normal to explain that to a patient in detail because it's quite intimate. So I found those easier to explain over the phone in a detailed but patient focused way and quicker as well. Yeah. Did you, Alex, did you have many where you were going to bring them down for an examination so you didn't have like a set? 100% diagnosis and um, because I'm sort of wary of the telephone for those not getting all the management marks I think I, I can't remember I definitely had a couple where I said I think the most likely thing is this but it could also be x or y therefore I'd like to bring you down and this is specifically what I'm looking for so I think I had a little girl who was constipated and she sounded very impacted and it didn't sound like a, an acute abdomen or anything, but she was quite little. So I sort of said that to mum and said, I think this is the most likely thing and I'll talk you through the management. But I think it'd be helpful if you brought her in later today and this is what I'll be looking for specifically to rule out these things. Um, I think that's how I did it. Um, but again, I don't know whether I passed that case. I hope I did, but I don't know. But that's how I sort of navigated it. I'm sure other people will do it differently, but that's how I did it. Thank you. it's just kind of a case of trying to play the game and showing that you're competent but also trying not to sound stilted but I think the practice it does get a bit easier we have a copy of your slides Alex yeah. um, I can thank you um, I can add them to this chat if that's helpful Can I just ask why you're doing that? For the um for uh uploading cases, does it, does it always have to be symptom based or could you do a kind of follow up with results or something like that? Or do they have to pick as many of the kind of criteria as possible? So they talked about this at the deanery day. Generally, so looking at the RCGP complexity thing, they said what they found is that people who are doing follow-ups and results don't tend to tick all the boxes they need to get the points they need. But they did have as one of our role plays somebody who was phoning up about um, sort of an isolated rising creatinine. And by the end of it, it was a suit they said it was a suitable case because there was quite a lot of psychosocial stuff going on and you actually needed to take a history to work out whether or not there was an underlying cause for it. So I think theoretically it's fine, um, but practically probably a new case would be easier, but it's not impossible. 